Hello everyone. Today I'll be talking about self-supervised learning for computer vision, specifically for images, video, and 3D. One of the major success stories in computer vision or most of machine learning has been the rise of supervised learning. Most of the AI applications in computer vision today use supervised learning. So for example, your image search engines, image tagging, or recognizing objects, the models that power most of these functionalities are trained using supervised learning. In supervised learning, we have an input, in this case, say an image i, and we feed it through a model, uh, for example, a continent, that tries to come up with a bunch of predictions. In this case, it's trying to recognize what's present in the image. And it tries to say that there are three different concepts, either a dog, tree, or a table, and it's producing some kind of scores associated with each of these concepts. Now, in order to train this model, we need access to labels. So in this case, someone labels this image as containing a tree, and now we can compute an error between the model's prediction and the label, and this gives us a loss or a way to train this model. And we can update the model's parameters so that the model, next time it sees this image, can predict correctly that it contains a tree. So supervised learning seems fine. I mean, it's a great paradigm. What is the bottleneck with using supervised learning? Well, it is this access to supervision. Getting real labels is extremely difficult. And to convince you of this, I'm going to start with a hypothetic, hypothetical experiment. So let's try to ask this question. Can we get labels for all data? And what we'll do is we basically try to look at different types of supervision or different types of labels for images and how many images we can get for each of these types of labels. So in the first case, we are going to look at images with bounding boxes. So in this case, we have images that have been labeled with certain types of concepts. So for example, dog, chair, and pizza are present in this image. And we also have a bounding box and drawn by the user telling us where the dog is or where the chair is and where the pizza is and so on. Now, if we take all the images that contain this kind of supervision, we'll get about a million or so such images. And you can imagine that drawing boxes for all of these kinds of categories is a typically difficult and arduous time consuming task. And so the amount of supervision is kind of limited. Now, if we were to relax the constraint that we don't really care about boxes, all we care about is knowing whether this image contains particular types of visual concepts. For example, um, what are typically called image level labels, we get an order of magnitude more data. So this is like the ImageNet dataset with 14 million images or so. And this is much quicker to annotate or much quicker to label. Now, if you were to think if what uh, the typical scale of internet data sets or internet photos is, all of these data sets really pale in comparison. So the internet, with a very conservative estimate, has at least trillions of images. Uh, and in this case, there's not an error in the plot. It's just that the bounding boxes in image level data sets are so small that you can't even see them in this graph. And when we go to log scale, we can immediately figure out that internet photos are about six orders of magnitude larger than whatever image level data sets that we have. And these are just photos. If you were to think about the real world and the large number of visual concepts that we have, this is just going to become an intractable labeling problem. And the largest image data set, ImageNet, needed about 22 human years to label. And so you can see that labeling is really not going to scale uh, to sort of ever increasing number of visual concepts or ever increasing type of visual data. So in general, labeling is just a very big challenge for us. It does not generalize to complex concepts. It does not generalize to complex types of data. And it's really not going to scale to the kinds of data that we're dealing with. Another problem is that if when we try to label things, there are lots of rare concepts, typically known as the long tail of visual recognition. So when we collect data, typically a, a very high number of classes are, have a very low number of samples. 
And so in this case, if we were to try to cover the diversity of visual concepts, it would be really hard because you'd need to collect exponentially more amounts of data to be able to cover this long range of visual concepts that we want to recognize. When we move on to different domains, labeling can itself be a challenge. There are certain visual domains, for example, medical imaging, where the labelers themselves are experts and these kind of concepts are really hard to label. So it's going to be very hard to scale this kind of labeling effort. Now, if labeling itself wasn't just the bottleneck, there are other challenges or other limitations of supervised learning. In 2019, we conducted a study where we took commercially available supervised AI models, uh, which are used for image recognition, and we basically evaluated them on a bunch of different images coming from this data set called Dollar Street. And in this case, I'm showing you basically three concepts, soap, spices, and toothpaste. And in the top row are images coming from developing countries in the world. And in the bottom row are images coming from developed countries in the world. And what we can see is that these commercial AI models are much better at recognizing images that come from the developed countries in the world as opposed to developing countries in the world. So in the top row, all the predictions are kind of incorrect. And in the bottom row, the predictions are typically correct. And in aggregate, we, when we plotted this accuracy as a function of where this picture was taken, uh, so in this case, the country of origin of that particular picture, we immediately found that there was a very strong correlation between the <clears throat> accuracy of the model and whether the picture was basically taken in North America or Europe. And that's basically because most of the data sets that are collected for these commercial recognition systems or even public data sets used in academic research have a very strong North America and Europe bias. And so when these AI models are trained on this data set, they're not able to generalize well to either uh, Asian countries or South America or even Africa, just because the data sets don't contain enough representative images from these uh, geographical locations in the world. Now, the other thing that was kind of surprising to us was that for each of this image that we had in this data set called Dollar Street, we also had an indication of the income of the household in which this picture was taken. So we could plot a curve of the income on the y-axis of, uh, of the household in which the picture was taken. And on the y-axis, we basically have the accuracy of the AI recognition model. And in this case, we are averaging the recognition accuracy across all the different sort of major commercial recognition systems uh, from different uh, vendors. And, and what we find is that the trend is consistent. Uh, basically, the AI recognition models are much better at recognizing pictures coming from higher income households uh, than lower income households, which kind of suggests that basically, even though labeling might scale, there might be certain biases in the way the data itself was collected or the labeling process, which can lead to very unintended consequences, um, in this case, geographical bias or income bias in the recognition system. So this brings us to this field of self-supervised learning. In self-supervised learning, we obtain the labels from the data itself using a semi-automatic process. So we don't use human annotators or human provided labels in order to train models. And the sort of key principle in most self-supervised methods is that you try to predict a part of the data from other parts of the data. So for example, say that you have data, you can split it up into an observ observed data and hide a particular part of the data. And you can set up a prediction problem where you train a model to predict this hidden data or some hidden property of the data from the observed data. So there's a very simple example, uh, and one of the most su successful examples comes from NLP, uh, actually from Tomasz Mikulov's work, where the idea is that you try to predict fill in the blanks. So you have a sentence, a cat jumped over the fence. And what you can do is you can just blank out a particular word. So in this case, cat, and you feed it, uh, feed the model this sentence, and you ask it to predict what word is likely going to be in this blank. And so now you've basically said that cat is the hidden data and the observed data is the remainder of the sentence. And you've set up a nice prediction problem and you can train a model to basically solve this prediction problem. 
So the models that have been trained using this in NLP have been really powerful. And word to vec basically being one of the early examples, and more recently bird style models have really shown a lot of progress in learning powerful representations for sentences and words using this mask prediction method. So in my talk, I'm going to focus mainly on self-supervised learning for computer vision. And we, when we think about computer vision and we want to learn good representations for it, there are two key properties we want these uh, features or visual representations to have. The first is multi-view invariance. And what I mean by this is that if you have a tree, you should be able to recognize the tree no matter the time of the day, no matter the angle in which you're looking at the tree, no matter the season. So you should still be able to recognize the tree in the summer or in the winter. And so no matter which view of the tree you're looking at, uh, the view sort of being a generalized notion of seasons or the night or uh, any kind of viewing conditions, you should be able to recognize the visual concept. And the second part is grouping, where basically if I look at different pictures of trees, I should be able to say that they are related to one another in some way. And if I look at a picture, a different picture, say for example of a cat, I should be able to say that this picture of a cat is not related to these pictures of trees. And the way we basically learn a self-supervised model, we really want these features to capture both multi-view invariance and grouping. And the one way to look at these basically self-supervised models is you have an input i and you feed it through the model, uh, the continent. And essentially what you're learning is a function f theta of i, where f theta can be interpreted as a feature of the input i. And you want f theta of i to basically have these properties of multi-view invariance and grouping. So when you get this sort of vector representation of the image, uh, which is f theta of i, you want this feature to satisfy both of these properties. And since 2019, basically, uh, up until even uh, most, uh, most sort of the recent methods, the key underlying principle of most of these self-supervised methods has been to learn features that are invariant to some kind of perturbation or invariant to some kind of augmentation. So in this slide, I'm showing you a picture of a deer so the image is on the top left and we've basically applied a bunch of different image operations. So slightly rotate the image, slightly change the color of the image, slightly zoom into it, zoom out of it. And we can basically create lots of these perturbed or augmented versions of this image uh, by applying these image augmentation techniques. And now what we want to learn is a feature representation which is stable under these different kinds of augmentations. So no matter the kind of augmentation I apply to the image, f theta of i should basically be, uh, give me the same feature vector uh, as f theta of augmented uh, version of i. So just writing it as a simple equation below. And this principle of invariance is pretty critical in learning uh, visual features. And it has actually been one of the guiding uh, principles of learning features even before deep learning. So when we learn features like key point descriptors uh, or hog features, invariance has basically been one of the fundamental properties of designing these kind of visual features. So how do we operationalize this insight of learning invariant features uh, into a continent? So the simplest way of doing this is to think about taking an image and computing say two different augmentations of it and of course you can do multiple different augmentations but let's just stick with two for simplicity and now when you feed in both of these different augmentations uh, of these image of this image into a continent the feature produced by the continent should be unaffected by this image editing or data augmentation technique and essentially uh, this has been one of the guiding principles for learning good representations and a lot of different techniques that have popped up and have been like super successful in the past um, like multiple years are really designed based on this. Now they differ slightly in the kind of optimization that they're using, but un the underlying principle in learning this feature is going to be the same. That you may have different sort of views of the input image being constructed by data augmentation and you're trying to learn an invariant representation.
And these sort of techniques can be grouped together into two uh, different parts. Uh, one being similarity maximization techniques uh, and the other being redundancy reduction techniques. And I'll talk about what the sort of uh, differences between both of these methods are. But it's really a more optimization thing than uh, any sort of uh, other uh, technique. So these self-supervised methods are typically trained on ImageNet, uh, the ImageNet dataset, and we uh, throw away the ImageNet dataset's labels so that we can train a representation, and then we can evaluate this representation on a bunch of different tasks. And ImageNet is considered one of the gold standards for this one, just because you can train a supervised representation on this dataset. So you can take the same images, you can take the labels on it, and you can train a representation by asking it to predict basically all the classes in this data set. And what has been shown is that the features that you learn by this kind of supervised learning transfer really well. So one of the things that the self-supervised researchers have been trying to do is learn features in a self-supervised way using the same data, but no labels, and show that these features actually can transfer better than the learning features in a supervised fashion. And one of our works, uh, from CVPR 2021 called Perl uh, showed that this is actually possible. You can learn good feature representations uh, from ImageNet dataset, which can actually outperform this uh, supervised representations. So in this work, uh, we basically introduced this concept of pretext invariant representation learning. The idea is basically that you have an image I and you can apply an image transform uh, to it and this image transform can be a very general way. It's not just about changing the color or sort of rotating it or so on. It can actually be something as involved as chopping up the image and just like randomly shuffling its patches. So it's just a very sort of general notion of image transforms. And you can feed in both this image and its transform version into a continent. And what you're now going to uh, say is that you're going to impose this condition that the feature that you get from image i and image it is going to be the same. And the way we do this is by using something called contrastive learning. And I'll talk about what that is in a bit as well. Now, what this ends up doing is basically Perl ends up learning features that are invariant to data augmentations and also to multiple views or these multiple perturbations created by something called pretext tasks. And these pretext tasks were actually one of the more popular ways of learning self-supervised features until this uh, principle of invariance became more popular. And essentially, Perl shows that you can actually use all of the uh, like research behind these pretext tasks and just add it into this uh, principle of invariant learning, and then basically just learn features that are going to be very powerful. So now, coming about con talking about contrastive learning. Contrastive learning is a more general sort of phenomenon or general technique where you have a set of related and unrelated images. So in this case, the blue images are related to one another, the green images to one another and so on. You pass them through a network to obtain their embeddings or features. And now the loss function is going to impose this constraint that all the embeddings coming from the positive or the related samples are close by in the feature space and all the embeddings coming from unrelated samples are far away in the feature space. So to illustrate with an example, if you had features coming from the blue embeddings, which are related to one another, you want those features to be as close to each other as possible, and you want all the other features or the unrelated features are to be far away. So in this case, the green features and the purple features. And the related samples, so the blue samples in this case, are called positives and all the unrelated samples are called negatives. Uh, so the green and the purple are negatives for the blue. So now, given this view of contrastive learning, what Perl is doing is basically that the positives that are being created are the image features and say the patch features uh, or the augmented features and any other random image or any other image in the dataset for that matter is considered an, uh, a negative image for this case. And so when we learn this uh, feature, we wanted to basically pull together the features coming from image I and image IT, its augmented version, and push away the features coming from any other image in this dataset. 
Of course, contrastive learning is not the only way of learning these representations. In 2021, we had another paper called Barlow Twins, which showed that you can learn these representations in a much simpler manner through a redundancy re reduction objective. And we call this method uh, Barlow Twins. The key difference between this line of research as opposed to say contrastive learning is that this line of work does not try to maximize the similarity between the representations that you're getting from the image and its augmented version. Instead, it's trying to reduce the redundancy between these two representations. And the idea for it really comes from neuroscience, from Horace Barlow's efficient coding hypothesis. Uh, the hypothesis being that when neurons in the brain communicate, because the brain itself has limited sort of physical real estate and uh, actual energy constraints uh, in, the term, in terms of how many, how many neurons it can have and the energy consumed by each neuron, the codes that are being used for communication across neurons need to be efficient. And so these spiking codes automatically should reduce the redundancy between neurons. And this kind of efficient coding has actually been observed in animal brains, uh, for example, in cat brains. Now to realize this uh, method in a neural network, we again followed the same paradigm. We took an image, we computed two of its versions uh, by data augmentation. We feed them forward through a network and we get a representation for these images. And now instead of doing contrastive learning, we do something quite simple. We just compute an empirical cross correlation matrix between these two representations. And then we have a loss function that tries to make this cross correlation matrix as close to the identity matrix as possible. And that's it. So Barlow twins ends up becoming a much simpler method for learning these representations. And we showed in our work that the representations that you get from doing this kind of redundancy reduction are as powerful, if not better, than the representations that you get from contrastive learning. So overall, it just simplifies the process of learning these representations. We also had another work where we tried to apply self-supervised learning in the real world. So rather than training all these models on, these, on this small sort of ImageNet data set, we decided to train this model on a much larger data set. So we took 1 billion random internet images with, and these images were not filtered in any way. We did not take their labels or metadata, so it was just the raw images. And we trained our self-supervised model on these images, and we call this model SEER. What we found is SEER's representations work really well across a variety of different tasks, because it has seen so much of the visual world through these billions of random internet images. And most surprisingly, SEER's representations work really well for images coming from different parts of the world. So once again, on this slide, I'm showing you images that come from um, Asia. So these are spices coming from Nepal and stuff coming from China. And we have a supervised model that's trying to recognize this image content. And the supervised model, again, is not doing a very good job on either of these images. Whereas the representation from SEER is actually able to recognize the content in these images pretty well. On a bunch of public benchmarks, we found that the representations from SEER outperform supervised learning uh, pretty uh, handily. Now, another aspect of self-supervised learning beyond sort of these performance gains has been different types of tasks. And in one recent work, we found that self-supervised learning can actually enable discovery kind of operations. So this work, uh, which we titled Emerging Properties in Self-Supervised Vision Transformers, or DINO for short, shows basically that in self-supervised learning, when you're training these models and you inspect what these models learn, they automatically learn to group together pixels belonging to the same object. So on this slide, I'm showing you uh, an image on the left. And basically what we're looking at is the self-attention map from the model that was trained without any labels. And we're visualizing its self-attention. And what we find is that the model is really grouping together pixels that belong to the same object. So it's grouping together pixels of the bird, of the toothbrush, of the boat, or of the bicycle. And in fact, this is not just about grouping together one object. When we inspected this even more closely, 
we found that if there are multiple different concepts in the image, the model is actually able to group them together uh, separately as well. So in the top left image, it's actually grouping together the carrots or the different vegetables um, on the bottom left corner. It's grouping together the flag separately or the building separately and so on. Uh, and so this property naturally emerges by training the self-supervised model and it's actually able to discover these kinds of objects. So here's a short video of the model basically being applied on a video and we're basically just applying in it in a frame by frame fashion. And what we find is it's actually separating out the foreground object, in this case, the dog pretty easily. Now researchers in France further sort of verified that this is actually indeed the case. And they presented a technique where they can use these features coming from Dino and use it to detect boxes and uh, detect objects and draw boxes around them in a pretty compelling manner. And they showed that these boxes can then further be grouped together uh, into different classes. And now you can basically discover these kinds of objects uh, and these kinds of labels in a completely automatic manner. Now, moving on to other types of visual data, we've also experimented with self-supervised learning for videos and 3D. In one of our papers at CVPR21 called AVID, we showed that you can use audio as a source of supervision to train very rich visual features. So in this uh, paper, we used, again, contrastive learning, but we used audio as a source of supervision to learn these visual features. So to create these positive samples, what we did was we took a video and its corresponding audio, and we treated them as positives, and we took any audio coming from a different video as a negative. And now we set up a contrastive learning problem to learn visual features. So given a video, we have a video encoder that takes in the video, uh, the visual part of it and it creates a video, an embedding for it. And now with the audio, we can again uh, feed it to a separate encoder and come up with an audio embedding. Now given these two embeddings, we can perform contrastive learning where VI and AI, which come from the same video, should be close together in the feature space and VI and AJ, where AJ comes from a different video, should be far away. When we train the model this way, we found that it can learn a very good visual representation and a very good audio representation. And so we explored what the similarity of different videos in their visual and audio space. So in this slide, I'm looking at a reference video in the top row. And we're looking at basically at its nearest neighbors in either the visual similarity uh, space, in the audio similarity space, or in both spaces. And so in the top row, we basically have examples that are similar to the original reference example in both video similarity and audio similarity. So if you look at a person in the top row who's dancing, the positive or the nearest neighbor in both spaces tends to be a person who's also dancing. The same goes for a person who's playing the violin or a moving train. If we were to only rely on visual similarity, which is the third row, we find that we can get people who are doing very similar exercises, uh, basically a person who's exercising or a person who's playing another instrument, but in this case, it's a guitar. And these examples look very visually similar to the reference. However, if you listen to their audio, they're going to be vastly different because a guitar will sound very different from a violin. And in the bottom row, we have examples which were only similar in the audio space. And once again, if you have a person who was say fishing with the same background music as a person who was dancing, then that might end up becoming an example that is similar. And so the audio feature itself is actually pretty powerful and it can find things which are similar in the audio space. So basically, just by learning this cross-modal representation in a self-supervised manner, we get a very good visual representation, a very good audio representation. And if we look at both these feature spaces and similarity in both audio and video, we'll get examples that are semantically very related to the original input. Now, at the time, when we took this AVID model and we evaluated it on a bunch of these video action recognition benchmarks, it led to state-of-the-art performance and very efficient models uh, on these two benchmarks, UCF and HMDB. 
we also did another interesting experiment where we took this model and we inspected what it thinks is the source of sound. So basically we took its audio embedding for a video and we just ran it over the particular video to see which pixels are creating that sound according to the model. And here's one example of this particular video. So on the left, you have a person who's dancing and we're basically just looking at what the model thinks is the source of the sound. And you can see that basically it's really focusing on the person when it's trying to figure out where the source of sound in this particular video is coming from. And here are a few other benchmarks on which basically Avid and its uh, follow-up called RxID end up really performing well uh, compared to state-of-the-art methods. Now this same idea of contrastive learning also works in 3D. And another paper we showed basically that you can take point clouds, you can apply different types of augmentations to these point clouds, the 3D data, and you can once again apply contrastive learning so that the features coming from these two augmentations are similar and train an encoder or a model using this kind of uh, technique. Once we take these features and we fine tune them on a downstream task, we find that these models can actually learn in a very label efficient manner. So we get the same object detection performance with half the number of labels on this very challenging data set called a ScanNet for indoor 3D object detection. And in particular, we found that these self-supervised 3D features were really successful at improving the performance for classes with limited amount of data. So on the x-axis, we have the number of labeled instances. So of course, as you go on the right, you have this class chair where you have lots of labeled examples. And on the y-axis, we are looking at the gain in performance by using our self-supervised model. And you can see that basically for classes with lower number of samples, less than 1000 samples typically, the gain offered by our model is much larger, showing that basically for these kind of classes where you have limited amount of supervision, self-supervised learning can actually be a very good way of improving performance. We've also done some work to show that self-supervised learning is actually complementary to supervised learning, and you can use self-supervised learning to improve supervised models. In another work called ClusterFit, we basically explored this ability of self-supervised learning to improve any kind of pre-trained model. Our main idea is that we take any pre-trained network and we use lots of unlabeled data to improve it. And we tested this idea at billion scale, so like a very, very large model with very strong supervised models uh, in both video and image recognition tasks. So the first step for ClusterFit is to take your pre-trained model, which can be any pre-trained model, uh, supervised or unsupervised, and we take this data set, which has no labels, and we extract a bunch of features uh, using this pre-trained network and cluster these features. So it was just simple k-means clustering this case. So suppose we were to cluster this feature space into th uh, three clusters, uh, so we get one, two, and three. And now what we do is we take a new network uh, and we train it from scratch to predict for each image which cluster it belongs to. And you can see that this is a completely self-supervised task. We do not use any human labels because all this second network is doing is it's predicting the cluster to which an image was assigned to. And now what we found is basically that this second network, which is the green network on the slide, actually ends up outperforming the original pre-trained network. And you can think of this method as basically a form of knowledge distillation, uh, where the original network, we are basically using its features uh, to perform a clustering step. And the second network is learning from these uh, cluster centers. Uh, and basically what we show is that the second network ends up outperforming the first one. And one of our sort of intuitions for why this works is that this clustering step introduces a bottleneck and only the most important information is transferred from the original network to the new network. So on the left-hand side, we have the original feature space. We cluster it. And when we cluster it, we've drastically reduced the amount of information in the labels. We've basically made this representation super sparse. And now this new network that we are fitting in the second stage, the green network from my earlier slide, is just predicting this kind of sparser information. And it learns a new feature space 
which is better for downstream tasks. And another way of thinking about this is basically what we have shown is that self-supervised learning can be used to fine-tune representations without using any label data. When we tested this cluster fit model on a variety of different vision tasks, we found that it led to pretty impressive performance gains on image recognition and video recognition. So in this slide, we are looking at an image recognition model that was trained with 1 billion images. And ClusterFit was able to improve it by more than 4 percentage points on ImageNet and, I, and more than like 5 percentage points on iNaturalist, which are both very challenging recognition tasks. And on the right, we have a video recognition model that was trained with 19 million labeled videos. And using ClusterFit on top of it, improved this model's performance by more than 3% on action recognition benchmark uh, kinetics and more than, again, 3.5% on sports 1 million, which is another actual recognition benchmark. So in general, self-supervised learning in vision works on image, video, and 3D data. It's pretty much the same underlying principle where we're trying to learn these features that are kind of invariant to an augmentation or invariant to a perturbation. We've seen that self-supervised learning can actually enable training with few labels. It works at scale for example, like the SEER models. And they, these kind of models can be more robust and fair and work on general image distributions. For other techniques in self-supervised learning are actually complementary to supervised learning and can improve supervised models. And self-supervised learning can go far beyond just like numerical improvements because it enables novel applications like object discovery. Now, so far in my presentation, what you've seen is basically when I go from one method or one modality to the next, we have to change the architecture, we have to change the setup a little bit. And so moving forward in our research, we are really trying to look at general models. But why general models? Well, current machine learning models are extremely picky eaters. When we are designing a computer vision model, we design completely separate architectures depending on whether they're going to process image inputs or video inputs or 3D inputs. And because these architectures are different, they have basically no sharing at all and they're trained completely independently. Now this seems a bit weird, right? We have the same visual concept, a pineapple, either in an image or in a video or in 3D. And of course, a pineapple looks kind of the same actually in all of these three things but we're going to train completely different models to recognize a pineapple, depending on the type of input that's being specified. This creates a plethora of problems. The first being that when we want to recognize a pineapple in 3D, we would explicitly need 3D supervision. It does not matter if we have lots of labeled images or lots of labeled videos of pineapples, because we are going to train a separate 3D model. And so it really can't leverage the fact that we have lots of trained images or like lots of labeled videos of a pineapple. And so depending on the type of modality that you have, you would really need supervision for that exact modality. If you want to recognize pineapples in videos, you would need lots of labeled videos of pineapples. And then in that case, having lots of 3D examples, is really not going to be beneficial. So moving forward in our research, we've been looking at designing single omnivorous models. These models can take as input either image or video or 3D, and we train a single model to basically recognize any of these kinds of concepts. So this model will produce this recognition of pineapple, no matter whether the input is an image, video, or 3D. There are several advantages of using these kinds of omnivorous models. The first is that this model produces a single shared representation or a single shared feature of the input. So if you were to feed in lots of labeled images of a pineapple, RGB images, this model would still be able to recognize a pineapple in 3D despite never having seen a single labeled or for that matter, single unlabeled sample of a pineapple because it's going to produce the same exact representation. And so the classifier can generalize to this kind of new input. Uh, the second 
is that designing single omnivorous models really saves research and engineering effort. If you look at how computer vision has progressed, we've basically been designing separate features uh, be before deep learning. So we would have separate handcrafted features for videos, separate handcrafted features for images. When we moved on to deep learning, we would still have separate handcrafted architectures for different types of visual data. So either for 3D or for uh, images and so on. And even now, more recently with transformers, transformers are still being designed separately for either images or for videos or for 3D. And so this, if we were to design single omnivorous models, we basically just need to spend our research and engineering effort into optimizing models, into researching them uh, only once, because now this model is optimized for all three modalities to begin with. And finally, creating these kinds of omnivorous models helps us leverage new modalities. So for example, if you had a single model that was trained on all three of these tasks, uh, all th three of these modalities, RGB, uh, video and 3D, but at deployment time, you only had say video data, but suddenly now you actually are equipped with the new capability of having stereo inputs, for example, in the new Ray-Ban stories. Now so this model can actually leverage this new modality without retraining because it has been trained for all these three things. And so it can now recognize these new concepts, leveraging its 3D recognition capabilities without retraining. So this year, at this year's CVPR, we have a paper called Omnivore, where we designed a single model for many visual modalities. And in Omnivore, we basically leveraged the modeling capabilities of a transformer to be able to process together images, video, and single view 3D using the same exact model. Our key idea in this case is that we take an image, we can split it up into a bunch of patches, and then we basically process these patches of the image and feed them into a transformer. We can repeat the same process for a video, but in this case, the patches are going to be small temporal tubes in time. And now we can again convert these into embeddings and feed them through a transformer. In the case of single view 3D, we can process the depth and the RGB separately and convert them into these embeddings, which go into the transformer. Now the transformer, is kind of agnostic to basically whether these embeddings are coming from the same image or are coming from a video or are coming from single view 3D. And basically the transformer self-attention mechanism can automatically perform spatial, temporal, and 3D reasoning, all using the same exact parameters to uh, produce a single representation. What we found is basically that this single omnivore model actually can be as good or even outperform modality specific models. So in this slide, I'm showing you the performance on three benchmark datasets from images, uh, so ImageNet, from video, Kinetics, and 3D, SunRGBD. And what we are looking at are three different model sizes for Omnivore, with uh, Omnivore basically the top, uh, the top block being a small model, a Swin Tiny model, the middle block being a medium-sized model, a Swin small model, and the large one being uh, the bottom uh, block being a Swin base model. And in each of these three cases, what we find is the omnivore model with the same exact parameters can actually outperform modality-specific models. So just looking at, say, the bottom part of it, an image Swin B model can only do image recognition, but the omnivore model can outperform it on the ImageNet dataset. The video model can only do video recognition, but still this uh, omnivore model is actually better than it on video recognition tasks. Now, apart from all of these things, we also found a very important property that emerges from training an omnivore model. So in this particular slide, what we're looking at is an image in the left-hand side, and we feed it through an omnivore model to get its representation and we compute nearest neighbors using this feature in different modalities. So for the image, we can compute its nearest neighbors using depth, or we can compute nearest neighbors using single view 3D or video. And what we find is that the model can actually learn to align all of these different modalities. So the image nearest neighbors in depth actually look like pineapples. The image nearest neighbors in single view 3D again are pineapples, and the same holds for video. 
and all the other examples in this particular slide. So what this shows is basically this, that this model has learned to recognize all of these different visual concepts and um, basically produce a single representation irrespective of the fact that whether they're video or depth or single view 3D. And I note that for this particular model, we really did not have aligned supervision. What I mean by that is that we basically had a separate image data set, a separate video data set, and a separate 3D data set. So off the shelf data sets, uh, which basically means that there was no semantic alignment between these three things. We didn't really have a single example for which we had a video and depth and single view 3D. This property is completely emergent just because of the fact that we're using a single shared encoder. And that produces a single shared representation, which seems to work really well across these different modalities. So in conclusion, uh, today I talked about self-supervised learning for images, video and audio, and 3D, and how all of these models basically that we learn through self-supervised learning are very capable models uh, for image recognition, can le lead to better, more robust models, and actually are complementary to supervised learning. And in the future, we're looking at general models that can actually learn to model all types of visual data together so that we can have lots of benefits of cross-modality sharing and actually move more towards general machine learning models and general computer vision models. Uh, so that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ishan, for your extremely interesting talk, uh, uh, spanning so many domains and modalities. That's uh, really impressive. So perhaps on behalf of the over 200 uh, people in the audience, let me uh, just issue a brief ovation for you. And um, yeah, we have actually no shortage of questions in the Q&A uh, stream. Uh, so let me start with the one that seems to be most liked among the uh, the viewers, the, 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 the audience, namely, is it true that unsupervised pre-training using autoencoders is obsolete? I read that self-supervised or semi-supervised learning usually give better results. So uh, I wouldn't say it's obsolete. There are actually recent work showing that it is possible to learn uh, representations using autoencoders with a transformer. I would say that it still is an open question whether the representations that you learn using autoencoders are as sample efficient. So what I mean by that is you can train a representation with the autoencoder, but then to achieve the same performance on a downstream task, say image classification, you're likely to need more labels to get So they're much better for tasks like image retrieval, image classification, and image recognition. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's, uh, uh, yeah, the, the connection was a bit uh, shaky at the moment, but I think that most of the message uh, came through, namely that this, uh, uh, that there's no clear, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> no distinction now, and there's no clear winner when it comes to, to, to the, you know, uh, to the, features trained in an unsupervised manner or semi-supervised or self-supervised manner. Good. So another question, next one on the list that seems to be very liked by the audience is, is it easy to, uh, okay, it is easy, sorry, to augment images for training simple classification model, but what with the object detection um, uh, and segmentation? You cannot easily rotate single objects on image. The image will look unrealistic. Right. So um, I agree with this particular statement. It is harder to augment uh, in like particular instances and especially like three rotation. We can, uh, but we can try to like share the image, but it's not going to model out of plane rotations. Now the main uh, issue basically is that when you try to just do this particular object detection task by doing these rotations, it may not work. But what has been shown pretty conclusively is that if you train representations just by global image transformations, these representations transfer very, very well to detection tasks and segmentation tasks. So although I agree with your concern and I share that concern that you cannot do these augmentations very easily for single instances, 
in practice it has been shown that if you do that just on a global image level learned representations will transfer very well for these segmentation and localization tasks yeah thank you uh thanks a lot for this uh, and another question so the next question is uh, will the general model lose the detailed information that could be crucial for fine-grained recognition of objects it's a bit general question i must admit but maybe you will make something of it yeah Can you still hear me? Yeah, we have some connectivity problems. I wonder if disabling your... Um... Yeah, let me try to stop my camera because I don't know what's going on. This is odd. Uh, yeah. But... Right. So, so should I, should I basically... repeat the question? Okay, good. No, I got the question. Yeah. So we haven't seen that concern. Uh, so the general models that we learn do seem to learn detection pretty well. Uh, they do seem to have like these fine-grained details in the representation. So we haven't really seen that concern yet. OK. Uh, thanks a lot. So maybe perhaps I will allow myself to interrupt this stream of questions from the audience with a question from myself, uh, which would be, uh, you know, um, uh, Indeed, you know, uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, future invariants seems to be relevant because indeed quite many we do want some degree of invariance of features in response to some stimuli. But uh, it's not always the, the case, right? We have uh, scenarios in which we actually, we would like some variability in the features in response to certain changes of the object being, uh, being uh, you know, recognized. So a kind of philosophical question would be, do we, always need to emphasize that invariance and you know aim at it at any cost uh, perhaps uh, there should be some something in between ideally that that's my you know private understanding uh, we would like to have some part of representation to remain invariant but, but some not and then the, the you know sixty four thousand dollar question is how to de delineate one from the another right so i i, I think it's an excellent question so I think overall, like disentangled representations where one part of the representation very nicely can sort of vary. So we would want like a nice representation where if you were to like flip the image, uh, then at least like some part of the representation tells you whether the image is flipped or whether it's rotated and so on. And with this invariance, we are actually going for something completely opposite. We're trying to say that the representation should not contain any of this information at all. So it is a completely like polar opposite view, but it, uh, and I think the main reason it works is basically for image classification tasks, we don't need it. But yes, if the task uh, at hand really required this. With like hand pose, when you want to write hand, uh, then in that case, basically having these like augmentations really appear in the feature representation is going to be very useful. Uh, I think it's just an extreme view that has been taken because we are sort of targeting very abstract tasks or like very semantic tasks. But I agree with you, like for the future and for like really general representations, we would need something of what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Thanks for confirming my, my guess. Um, good, uh, let's come back to the, to the list of questions. We still have a few minutes uh, time. Uh, so there's uh, a question about uh, the availability of publicly Pre public pre-trained models for visual feature extraction. Uh, the, the author of the question claims, I've checked that SEER of 2021 um, uh, has 1 billion parameters, so it could be hard to create such a model at your home. Yeah? So it's about a bit of, you know, about the democratization of machine learning in a sense. Right. Uh, that is true. I think this is a sort of common problem with any sort of a lot of them that we have. And um, one aspect of it, like in the research part, is basically just answering the question, do self-supervised models get better when you scale them? And so that was basically the sort of uh, line of research with SEER. Now, for the democratization part, we're really looking at ways of distilling the SEER model into smaller models, such that now when we provide them, uh, you actually have access to a small model, which is very powerful. But it's still kind of an ongoing uh, research area for us. 
because distilling self-supervised models is kind of new for vision. So it's easier to distill supervised models because you have some labels and you can sort of do student teacher training. But for self-supervised models, we are still working on techniques to basically come up with better distilled models so you can have smaller models uh, released. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, another question uh, comes from Ahmed and he asks, uh, I could have not understand what throughput an SSL model gives. For example, in supervised learning, when we test a Minace classification model, it gives a digit as an output. What would be the case when we train Minace data sets with an SSL method? What should we expect as the output? Does not it still need human supervision to evaluate the model? Yes. So uh, we need human supervision to evaluate the model. But you can think of basically what the self-supervised model gives you out before human supervision is just a feature representation of the image. And what ends up being the case is if you do some kind of nearest neighbor uh, retrieval in this like feature representation space, that already serves to like that already serves as a very good classifier. So if you had say some label data, uh, you can compute basically representations on the label data and on your incoming query data and just do nearest neighbor. And that by itself is pretty good. So you don't need to really train the representation very well. And of course, if you train it, you will get improved performance, but just using the feature representation for something as simple as a nearest neighbor classifier uh, will work pretty well in practice. Great, thank you. Thanks for this, I think, very clear question. Of course, unfortunately, we don't have feedback from the audience, but I hope that these answers are being found satisfying by, by, by the listeners. Uh, okay, we are allowed to stretch the discussion a bit, you know, to run into the uh, coffee break a bit. Uh, so if you don't mind, we still have a, a, a number of, uh, I think, interesting and uh, novel questions. Um, uh, there's a very concrete question, I think, from Marco. Uh, does this omnivorous type of model work in a similar way to Google's Pathways? So I think Pathways is more of like a general sort of modeling direction. Omnivore by itself is like a specific, like concrete instantiation of that. So Pathways is more about saying that you can have any kind of information flowing into any kind of model. With Omnivore, we were quite specific that we wanted to model all visual data together. So for example, like Omnivore does not model audio or it does not model text. Whereas in Pathways, you would kind of do that. And Pathways is more of like a framework for thinking. Whereas Omnivore, I would say is like a concrete model that actually works on visual data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm, the next question actually sounds a bit general, but perhaps uh, it will be interesting to see, to hear your answer to this, this question. Quite fundamental, doesn't seem to be strictly related to the uh, self-supervision uh, subject. Uh, is there a reasonable or minimal resolution of an image which is sufficient to train neural network for image classification task? Or how increasing the resolution of images influences the need to increase the image data set? So it's quite generic, but in a sense, I find it sort of interesting because indeed, when we, <clears throat> I just happen also to be working with very small images uh, recently, where in a sense that spatial aspect uh, gets broken in a sense. So do you have any like comment or opinion about uh, very small raster images? Um, I haven't worked with very small raster images. I can talk more about the high resolution part because that is something I have like uh, uh, experience with. So when we move towards classification tasks that really require fine grained reasoning, high resolution really helps. And so in that case, basically, if you're trying to recognize safe like fine grained breeds of a dog where like you know the only difference between two dogs is like the way their nose looks so in this sort of scenario it actually makes sense to have more high resolution data uh, than low resolution and what we found is basically you can have say one flow or 500 high resolution, or even small quantities of it is far more valuable than large quantities of low res data. But this is specifically for like very fine grained recognition tasks, uh, where like detailed details in the image really matter. So these details would be lost if you were to downsample the image when you're feeding it through. 
That, that's interesting. So would you say that, for instance, is it, is it perhaps due to the importance of textural features in some context? Yeah, it's texture and also like small, like essentially small parts of the image contain that relevant texture for this problem. Right. So when you're trying to distinguish between, say, two uh, like breeds of dog, which are extremely similar and the only difference is basically how their eyes are. Or let's take an extreme example. There are two species of ladybirds, uh, the insect, and one of them has three dots and one of them has two dots. And you're basically trying to classify them. And now you can have like a big image of that ladybird. Uh, with like leaf and everything and if you do down sampling you'll probably lose the detail in like the ladybird like whether it has two dots or three dots and that's probably what's needed to this species is of ladybird uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, again, the, the the audio is a bit patchy, but uh, I think we got the gist of the answer. Very nice example with those uh, three dot and five dot ladybirds. Indeed, uh, such details may matter, you know, in, in such contexts. Uh, good. And now we have a question from Rafael who asks, what features do you input to the omnivore model when you are inferring it on a single modality? For the bug, uh, backbones of modalities which you are not using, uh, uh, i.e., you are inferring the model on video. What are the inputs for image and 3D parts of, of the backbone? Do you input zero tensors and pay uh, to them zero attention transformer part of the model, or approximate inputs somehow based on the video? Uh, um, I hope that the message is uh, indeed yeah. quite quite clear. In a sense, what's the default value for the other modalities? So uh, basically, there is no default value. Uh, the model at input just takes a set of patches. So when we input the patches for a video, if the patches are coming from like images, then they have a spatial only. There is no temporal embedding. Uh, so there is no default value. Essentially, everything is converted into patches. So it doesn't matter if you have just a video, you'll have uh, patches of the video with space and time em uh, embedding to it. And then that goes into the transformer. If you have image as input, then you'll just have patches with space embedding, no time embedding, and that goes into the transformer. So you, you're not never doing any extra compute. So at inference time, it is equivalent to using a video model. If you're doing inference with an omnivore model. But the best part is at deployment, you just need to deploy a single model. It is as efficient as basically doing inference with an image only model, a video only model, or a 3D model. It's just that now you've reduced the number of parameters by one third because you just have like one single model for all three of them. Yeah, that sounds makes sense. Thanks a lot, uh, Ishan, for, for this answer. Uh, so we run into the coffee, coffee break uh, for about like six minutes. I guess that might be enough. So. Um, I hope that the other people you know, asking questions will forgive me if I uh, stop the discussion at this point. So again, uh, on behalf of the organizer, let me ask you, Ishan, for your uh, kind acceptance of the invitation to speak at, uh, at uh, the Ghost, uh, of this year's Ghost edition. It was really a pleasure for all of us. Uh, the, the, you know, the attendance of the lecture actually somehow proves that, uh, your, that the topics of your research are extremely interesting for, for our audience. So thank you very much once more. And of course, uh, you are always welcome to, you know, perhaps attend the event next year and, uh, and share new ideas uh, in, in next editions. Thank you very much once more. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And with this, we conclude this session. Thank you very much uh, all to, to, to all attendees for being with us. Uh, uh, let's have a break and uh, let's see each other in the next sessions in roughly half an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.